church, if you would stand and worship with us this morning.
is nothing, nothing that our God can't do. I love that bridge. I will believe for greater things. How many of you are believing for something greater? You're believing for a financial miracle. You're believing for more salvations in your family. You're believing for healings, physical healings in your body. And you know that there is nothing that God can't do. But he can't force us to accept those miracles. He can't force us to accept his blessings. He wants us to open our arms, open our hands, open our hearts to him. He is not going to force himself on us. He desires for us to go after him. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. God, as we sing this song, I pray that you would search us, find anything in our hearts that is hindering you from working in and through us. God, if there's something you want to do in my life, if there's something you want to do in our lives, remove the junk, remove the filth. God, remove our stubbornness, remove our anxiety, remove the things that keep you from being able to move in and through us. God, here's our heart. God, take all of us, not some of us, not the pretty parts, not just the nice parts that we bring to church on Sunday, but God, Take all of us. We're here, and our arms are open, and our hearts are open to you. Use us, Jesus. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord.
I think sometimes we forget that God is our Abba Father and that he withholds no good thing because he is a good father. And we've selected this song this morning because I think we need to be reminded that we belong to him. Father, just cry out to him. Lord, I belong to you, Lord. I belong to you. Holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. 
Oh, Lord God, you are holy indeed. High and lifted up, no one is like you. No one is stronger than you. No one is mightier than you. You are the victorious one. Lord God, there's no reason for us to fear or shrink back because we know that we find you to be a firm foundation and you steady us in moments of joy and in moments of sorrow, in moments of trial and challenge and sickness and persecution. We know that we find you faithful always because you were the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord God, we just want to honor you today. We want to remember who we are that puts us in our place as we remember who you are, lifting you to the exalted place. You're holy, holy, are you? your voice and praise the Lord and thank him for his goodness unto you today. Hallelujah. 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 Be glorified in this place, Lord. All right. Well, it's good to see you all in the house of the Lord today. Uh, you guys may be seated. I just wanted to take a few minutes here and highlight some things that are happening with the students and young adults coming up. Um, so this summer, the students, as you guys know, have raised over $1,500 for Speed the Light. So next Sunday, make sure you're here because Pastor Edie's gonna be leading worship with their hair colored. So that was the deal. The students are super excited. So you're gonna wanna make sure you're here for that because it's a once in a lifetime thing. Don't wanna miss it. So make sure you're here next Sunday so you can see that. Um, and then also we're gonna have another bake sale today, um, continuing to raise money for Speed the Light. I just wanted to thank all of you that have uh, come out and gave and purchased stuff from the bake sale. Um, the students really appreciate you guys coming alongside them, helping them reach their goals and helping them support missionaries around the world. Um, it's so important for us to be able to uh, resource our missionaries and help them get to where they need to be and have the things they need to reach people um, in their context. So make sure you stop by, come and see me. We'll have some baked goods, some muffins, maybe some donuts. Um, so make sure you stop by, get your sugar for the afternoon, then go crash. Um, next Sunday, we want to highlight, we have a young adults gathering. So if you are a young adult, come on out to that. I'll be there. It is at 6.30. Um, it's a great time of Bible study and fellowship and worship. Um, it's really good to be able to meet and interact with other young people 
that love God and are following after him and chasing after him. So if you are a young adult, make sure you're here next Sunday at 6.30. I look forward to seeing you guys. And then also next Sunday, for the kids and foundation, we are having a water day. Um, so if you have a student that's in Calvary Kids or Foundation, make sure they come ready to get a little wet next Sunday. Okay, so don't have them come in their, their Sunday best dress because it will get wet. Um, make sure you guys come and are prepared for that. Um, and we're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, so speaking of kids, we just wanted to take a few minutes here today to pray for our students that are going back to school. Some went back to school last week. Um, a lot of them are going back to school this week. So we want to take a few minutes and pray for them and our teachers, um, that God would be with them during the school year and that they would be safe. Um, and then after that, we're going to dismiss foundation. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll go from there. So dear God, we thank you for our students. Lord God, we thank you for what you're doing in their hearts and how you're growing and developing them. Lord, we pray that as they go back to school, that they would just be safe, that you would guard their hearts and their minds um, as they're learning and developing, Lord God. Lord, we pray that they would have a great year of growth and reaching the people around them and have an impact on the people around them. Lord, I also want to lift up our students to, or our teachers to you, Lord God, as they're heading back into the classrooms. Um, Lord, I pray that all their preparation that they've had over the past few weeks um, would prepare them for a great school year and that they would be able to teach and show the love of Jesus through their actions to their students, Lord God. And Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon each and every student, each and every teacher, as they prepare to go back to school. In your name I pray, amen. All right, Foundation, you are dismissed to the East Foyer, and Pastor Edie is going to come on up. Amen, amen. Well, thank you to Pastor Ian and the youth, raising over $1,500 so far this year. That is so exciting. That is certainly much more exciting than purple hair, although I am going to make good on my promise. Um, but I'm just so proud of these kids. You know, their goal for the year was 1000 and they've raised $1,000 with your help just this summer. So we definitely want to celebrate them and be grateful for that. We also want to um, just remember our pastor who's at home. We're still praying for you for healing, health, and wholeness, as well as many other people who are sick in our church. We have a few people who are in the hospital with COVID. We want to remember Ciola and Laura. These things are coming out on the email prayer chain. And if you're not getting that, you can go ahead on our Calvary website and you can sign up to receive these prayer requests so that we can be praying and standing together with our brothers and sisters. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Dan, better get back here soon because I'm getting tired. <laughs> But I am grateful that the Lord gives strength when we are weak. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, last week we talked about the early church and how the gospel cuts us to the heart and it causes us to examine where is your devotion. And I hope that that stuck with you throughout the week. I hope that you've been considering that and you've been wondering, you know, Lord, where am I lacking? Where am I holding back from you a little bit? The, the verse last week was they devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching to fellowship the breaking of bread into prayer, which broke down to biblical teaching, meaningful community, and spiritual disciplines. Well, one of the things that we get to do as a body is we get to pray together, and we get to worship together. And I don't know about you, I mean, I love my personal times of worship, but it does not compare to my corporate times of worship. Amen? Amen. So I just wanna let you know tonight at 6.30, we're gonna have that special time. And we're calling it linger because that's just what we're gonna do. We're gonna linger in the presence of the Lord and let the Holy Spirit have his way. We don't have to worry about timing or anything. It starts at 6.30, we don't put an end time on it, although I'm sure we won't be going all night. Well, who knows? No, I'm kidding, we won't. <laughs> um, but you know, it also gives us a chance and a time to come together and to pray together to pray earnestly for health and wholeness in our church body. Amen, we need that, right? To pray earnestly for reconciliation in our church body, 
to pray for unity in the church at large, right? To pray for persecution. I mean, the world stage has, has been front and center with Afghanistan in this last week. And it's heavy on the hearts of people. And it should be heavy on the hearts of people. But persecution's always been happening. So it should always be heavy on the hearts of people. We should always be praying for our brothers and sisters around the world who can't do this right here. So that gives us that opportunity to do that tonight. Um, so I do hope you'll come out and you'll join us. There's plenty of room to spread out. It's just going to be a beautiful time. Last time we did this, it was just so filled with the Holy Spirit. And I just really felt bad. I felt, not bad, I felt sad. I felt sad for everybody who missed it. So I hope you won't miss that tonight. Because you know, there's power in prayer. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, Paul, the Apostle Paul writes this, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Right? Always be praying for all the Lord's people. We can do that for one another. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Paul is asking the church to pray for him, right? Just the same as you, I hope, are praying for all of your pastors and all of your leaders here because we need your prayers. We covet your prayers. And then Paul ends that. He says, pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And my brothers and sisters, that's my prayer this morning, that I would fearlessly proclaim the word of God and that we would get into the word of God and learn together. Right, so to, today is really more of a, a kind of a teaching type of thing, but it's, it's so important. You know, the today's Western church, what, what do they pray for? Anybody, top two things. Peace and comfort. That's what the church, the Western church prays for, top two things, peace and comfort. Some pastors are diluting the true gospel and teaching false doctrines altogether, and then there are churches that don't even preach from the word of God at all. They've totally distorted it. They gather around themselves a great number of people and tell them what their itching ears want to hear. They're people pleasers and they are not leading people to Christ. They're leading them to hell. I'm just going to call it what it is. But the apostles in the early church, they had a completely different mindset. They prayed for boldness and courage. They prayed that the Holy Spirit would give them, or, or that they would stand firm in the Holy Spirit power to be the witnesses of Christ. And we can do the same thing today. Amen? See, Pastor Dan has been reminding us for several months, he had series where he, he, he titled it, Flips, Jesus Flips the Script. You know, you think it's going one way, and then boom, it's something else, you know? I mean, we, we pray for um, these blessings. But Jesus said this, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It seems a fitting time that we would join together and we would remember our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan and around the world who are living this in a way that we don't know. We, 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 our persecution often consists of, oh, well, if I say something, they might not like me. God help us. I mean, we're going to be studying Saul this morning, Saul slash Paul, who knocks on doors because he's trying to gather up the Christians, and this is a reality happening. So would you just join me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord God, as one body. One body with you, Jesus, as the head. And we know, Lord God, that when one part suffers, we all suffer. 
Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters, not just in Afghanistan, but across the globe, Lord. Those who are, are reaching out to you, standing for you, those who are in underground churches, those who are sharing one Bible with different scraps of pages and sharing it so that they can feed on your word. Lord, are people who know that the reality is that today could be the day they meet you face to face and their prayer in the midst of it all is Lord bring revival. <laughs> they have boldness, they have courage because they know who they belong to. They know that you are their Abba Father, Jesus, you are their Savior, and you will not fail them. We're all going to pass from this life. This, this body is just a tent, but no one can take our soul because we belong to you. So, Lord God, we just lift up our brothers and sisters, and I pray, Father, that it isn't just something that happens today or while this is mainstream media news. But Lord God, that every day we remember our brothers and sisters in the world who don't have the freedoms to worship that we do. And Father, forgive us for squandering the freedoms that we have. Lord God, they have more courage and more boldness than the American church. Let us stand up and wake up and learn from them. Bless them by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, for surely, surely you will sustain them in all things. And we offer this prayer in the name, the name above all names, in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, you know, I, was, I mentioned Matthew, and I'm just going to finish uh, the, the passage Matthew 5, 11, and 12, where Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, Jesus gave the disciples, the apostles, a forewarning. He told them, this is going to happen. Not it might happen, it's going to happen. When he said this in John 15, Verse 20, he said, remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. You know, the world is not really concerned when you say something about God because they have so many different gods it doesn't really define anything for them. But when you say the name Jesus, they get offended because that's specific. That's specific. Why is that specific? Because there is a war against the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. And what we have to say, we're going to do a, a quick walk through Acts until we get to Paul. But what we, I want you to think about as we're doing that, I want you to consider this question. Will I stand for the name in my generation? Am I willing to do whatever it takes so that the name of Jesus will be exalted in my generation? So last week we were in Acts chapter 2, and I, as I said, I'm just going to do kind of a quick walkthrough. For people who have a hard time reading the Bible, and I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but I know sometimes people say, I don't know, it's hard to read the Bible because it's hard to understand. Acts is such a great book to read because it's historical. It's just reading a story. This is what happened. Same thing with Genesis. It's just a story right? And, and so, I mean, it's a true story. Don't, don't discard what I'm saying, whether it's a story. But it's, in other words, these are actual accounts of things that happened, right? So it's just like somebody's sitting down and telling you, hey, I went to the store the other day and I bought, you know, whatever, right? <clears throat> so we're just going to do a quick walkthrough. So in Acts chapter 3, we find that Peter and John are walking, uh, going to the temple, and they're going there to preach. They're not going there to sacrifice. They're going at the time of prayer because they know there's an audience there. They know they can pray anywhere because Jesus is everywhere, right? <clears throat> but on this day, they go to the, the place and um, they're going through the beautiful gate and there's a beggar there and he's, he doesn't even look at them. He's just holding out his cup. 
I mean, think about that. Have you ever just been so stuck in your life, you're just same old thing, same old thing, same old thing, day after day after day after day, same old thing. This was this guy, just holding out his cup. Give me a coin, give me silver, give me gold, give me something. And Peter said, look at me. In other words, hey, wake up, look at me. He says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I will give to you. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And there was a miraculous healing. The man stood up and walked. Well, then that, of course, brought lots of attention. They went into the temple. The people knew this was the guy who had sat at the gate, and they wanted to know what was happening. And it gave Peter that opportunity to stand up and share the gospel again looking for every opportunity. Every incident that you have is a set up opportunity for you to share the gospel. Start to recognize that. I'm speaking to myself when I say that. Start to recognize that, right? And then they asked him, how did this happen? In verse 16, he says, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Well, in Acts chapter 4, same story. The priests are very, they're greatly disturbed, and they decide, let's just throw them in jail. And they asked them, they said, by what power or what name do you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but God, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed, always giving glory to the name Jesus. He went on to say in verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Only the name of Jesus goes on to say they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? I want you to think about that because there's going to come a day, my friends, that's going to be the question you have to answer. Am I going to listen to him? Am I going to listen to the Lord? Or am I going to listen to men? Peter goes on to say, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. And you know what happened? They let them go. And this is the gathering that went back to the disciples. And this is what they did. They prayed. And they prayed this. Now, Lord, consider their threats. Right? They just got out of jail. And they're saying, praying to the Lord, consider their threats. And enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They didn't shrink back. Give us more. Give us more power. Give us more boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. My friends, come here tonight so that we can shake and pray and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Well, in Acts chapter 5, we see that the high priests and the Sadducees are filled with jealousy, and they're a little ticked off because they didn't believe in the resurrection. There's a little joke. If you're trying to understand the difference between Sadducees and Pharisees, the Sadducees are the ones who don't believe in re resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. <laughs> so anyway, just a, a little thing, a little tidbit to help you remember. But they were filled with jealousy, and they arrested the apostles, and they put them in jail. But during the night, an angel appeared and set them free. And, and the angel didn't say, run for the hills. 
No, the angel said, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. So at daybreak, they entered the table, temple courts as they had been told, and they began to teach the people. So imagine the surprise of the, of the guards when they went to collect them from the jail, and the guards were there, and the doors were locked, and the people were gone. And they were dumbfounded. Where are they? And then somebody said, oh, wait, there they are. They're teaching in the temple. They were brought in for questioning. And the priest said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. And Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard that, they were furious, and they wanted to put them to death. Seems like killing Jesus wasn't enough for them. And now they were, they were concerned because Jesus had been seen by many, many people. And these people, the disciples, the apostles, were rising up, speaking the truth boldly, without fear. Well, there was a Pharisee named Gamaliel, and he was a teacher of the law. He was honored by all people, and he stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while so they could have like a private chit-chat. And then he addressed the Sanhedrin, and he said, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. And then he went on to remind them, you know what, in the past we've had people, leaders who have risen up and they've gathered a little, a little following, but then, but then the whole thing went to nothing. And then he said, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. How, do you, how many of you know you can put a fake apple on an apple tree and for a season it looks real, but eventually you're going to realize that's a fake, right? So there's wisdom in what he's saying. If their purpose, is of, or purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only, only find yourself fighting against God. And his speech persuaded them, and they called the apostles in, and they had them flogged, beaten. And they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They were rejoicing for their persecution. And day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah because the mission of God is greater than the threats of men. We have to get that so root, deeply rooted in our heart that the mission of God is greater than the threats of men because the men who are making the threats are living in darkness and God wants to bring them into his glorious light through Christ Jesus. Amen? Well, in Acts chapter 6, we're introduced to Stephen, and the scripture defines him as a man full of God's grace and power, and he did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. He had wisdom, and he spoke by the Holy Spirit. And the men falsely accused Stephen, and they brought him before the Sanhedrin. And he began to give an exposition of the patriarchs, going all the way back to Abraham. Well, he spoke boldly, and he spoke truthfully, and they didn't like it. And they decided they were going to stone him to death. And this is where we first see Saul. In Acts chapter 7, verse 58, it says, The witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Acts 8, 1, Saul approved of their killing. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. 
And those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. See, persecution advances the gospel. And maybe that's why the church in America is sleepy. Amen. Amen. Because persecution advances the gospel. Amen. When people scatter, they take it with them wherever they go. Amen. Right? So here we are. We're going to talk about Saul today. We're finally getting there. Pastor Dan's at home going, Shoo. <laughs> no, we're finally getting there. Um, turn to Acts chapter 9. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to give you a little overview. So, first of all, I don't pretend that everybody knows everything you need to know. The, we're going to be reading about Saul. Saul is the same person as Paul. Saul is the Hebrew name for Paul, and Paul is the Greek name for Paul. And because Paul was a, an apostle to the Gentiles, he became known as Paul. The same person. It's the same person. So what's really interesting when we want to say, well, who is Saul? That we can go to the writings of Paul himself. So that's what I've done. Because I think the greatest commentary for the Bible is the Bible. Right? It has everything we need right here. God's word stands firm. So in Philippians chapter 3, 5, and 6, this is how Paul describes himself. He was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. In case you didn't pick it up, Paul might have had a little self-righteousness going on there. Just a little. But that's what he believed at the time. He writes, or in Acts 22, we have an account where he's speaking in Jerusalem, and he says this to the people. I am a Jew. I'm sorry for those taking notes. Acts 22, verses 3 and 4. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicilia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel, Anybody remember that name? Gamaliel was the wise Pharisee who stood up and said, you might be fighting against God. This isn't wise. So it's very likely that Paul was in that meeting. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the follower of, followers of this way to their death arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. And then before King Agrippa in Acts 26, 9, and 11, 9 to 11, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. See, Paul was devoted to the God of Abraham. He was devoted to the law. He was a Pharisee. And in his perspective, he saw the way the followers of Jesus, as a credible threat. He saw it as deceptive teaching, and he was passionately determined to stop it. In his eyes, it was an honorable act before the Lord. In my Monday night group, somebody shared a quote from John Wesley that says this, light yourself on fire with passion, and people will come for miles to watch you burn. And I found the, the quote to be interesting, but incomplete. Because people are passionate about many things, and they can be passionately wrong. Passion does not equal truth. You have to examine the foundation of your passion. 
World religions have people who are passionately devoted. The Taliban in Afghanistan is passionately devoted. Atheists and Satanists have passion, but they have no truth because Jesus is the truth and the way and the life. Paul writes in Ephesians 2.20, that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. Look, you have to know why you believe what you believe. And if you don't know why you believe what you believe, you need to spend more time with the Lord and his word. You can't just say, well, I, I believe Jesus is the son of God. Why? Why? You have to have foundation for your passion or it's misguided. But then we could, we could take that same quote and we could say this, light yourself on fire with passion for God and people will come for miles to watch you burn because even people who hate you are still dumbfounded that you stand so firm in the Lord. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to read Acts chapter nine. And I'm just going to start with verses 1 through 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Damascus is about 130 miles northeast of Jerusalem, a six day journey. That gives you some insight to his vehemence about annihilating or ridding the people or the followers of the way. The church was growing, obviously, enough so that he felt his need to go there, right? And he was completely self-righteous on this mission of destruction. And note that he went with the blessing of the high priest, because they all hated the disciples of Jesus. But notice this, and be encouraged by this for those that you love who are resistant. Jesus is not deterred by one's hatred. Regardless of circumstances, Jesus will make himself known even to those who are not seeking him. The Bible Engagement Project says this, Saul, a devout Jew and student of the scriptures, passionately opposed early Christians and their message that Jesus was the Messiah. However, Jesus had other plans for Saul. So we go back and look at that a little bit. All of a sudden we see there's one extraordinary moment. He's there, he's got murderous threats, he's taken this six day hike. But before he gets there, he has a suddenly moment. I don't know about you, but I love suddenly moments. Because those suddenly moments when God just turns it around, it's undeniable that it's him, amen? You know, Jesus changes everything. Encountering the Lord Jesus changes everything. It redirects purpose. It redefines passion. It reconciles people. Because Jesus transforms lives. Well, in verse 3, it says, Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Now, I'm just going to do a little teaching here with you today because I want you to know the God we serve. Now, in the days of the Old Testament, Moses wanted to see the glory of God, and 
He said, no, you can't. Nobody can see my glory or they'll die. But Jesus appeared to the disciples. So consider this. These, these are, again, accounts, um, some of them even from Paul himself. In Acts 20, 26, 13, he says, About noon I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. I intentionally took just a second this morning as the sun was coming up to look directly at the sun. And I thought, wow, I don't know what Paul saw, but that was amazing because it was, the sun was so bright, and here, this is brighter than the sun. And think about this, in this transfiguration, when Jesus was on the mountain with Moses and Elijah, with Peter and, and James and John, and the scripture says this, that Jesus, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And when John, the Apostle John, was on the island of Patmos and got revelation in Revelation 1.16, it says his, his, meaning Jesus, his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And then Paul recounts the appearance of Jesus after the resurrection, that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. And in 1 Corinthians 15.8, he says, last of all, he appeared to me. Paul saw Jesus. I don't know exactly what he saw, but I know it was super bright, and I know he saw Jesus because he said he appeared to me. But not only did he see him, he heard him. He heard him. So some time ago, I was going to visit someone at Hillcrest Hospital, and it was a Saturday, late Saturday afternoon. There's pretty much nobody in the atrium area there, if you know what I'm talking about. And so I walk in, and I'm about halfway, and I hear, Edie! And I'm kind of like, there's nobody here except that dude over there, and he's not even looking at me. And again, I hear, Edie! And I start looking up on the higher levels, thinking maybe someone's shouting down from up above. It was Pastor Dan. <laughs> he was behind me, <laughs> probably enjoying the whole thing, getting a good laugh out of it as I'm going, God, is that you? <laughs> There's something that's very interesting when somebody calls you by name. Not, hey, you. I mean, even mothers know this, right? A child can say, Mom, and you know it's your kid. There's something about being called by your name. Well, God, or Jesus, called Saul by name because he knows you before you know him. Well, it goes on to say that he fell to the ground. He's probably very frightened. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. See, the appearance of Jesus proved to Saul that Jesus was alive and Jesus was God. So this was like a, I did not see that coming moment. Right? Especially since Saul thought he was serving God by persecuting those who followed Jesus. And now he's getting schooled. It's interesting that there are people throughout the ages who do things in the name of God, like Saul did, who need to be schooled. Right? We have to be completely close to the Lord in prayer in his word, trusting the Holy Spirit for guidance because it's very easy to get off course, my friends. Well, here, I want you to consider this. He says, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Because Jesus is the head of the body. 
And if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Jesus had told his disciples, he said, whatever you do for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And whatever you do not do for them, you did not do for me. This was kind of an ouch moment in my preparation. I mean, it's not like I didn't know Jesus is the head of the body, but I guess I just didn't really think about the fact that every time I get a little snarky, a little impatient, maybe a little judgmental or prideful, that I'm doing that to Jesus. Because everything that you do to a believer, you do to Jesus. Every word, every action. And I guess I would encourage you to consider that and think about, okay, wait, how, how am I treating my Savior? <laughs> how am I treating my brothers and sisters? We see in that moment that Jesus, this suddenly moment, that he redirects Paul. And I love this. God will stop your progress to advance his purpose. You ever, you ever been like, okay, this is good, this is what I'm gonna do, this is what I'm gonna study, this is where I'm gonna work, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, and all of a sudden, you just feel like you hit a wall. And you can't figure out what ever happened. Because you thought you were serving God, you thought you were doing his will, you thought you were going in the right direction. And it's not until a couple of years later that you realize that was God all along. Because God is willing to stop your progress to advance his purpose in your life. Well, he tells him to go, out, to, to go up into the city and that he'll be told what to do. And it says that he was three days, he was blind for three days. And it just causes me to think, was Saul blinded for three days so he could see the truth? Did God bring physical blindness so that he could give him spiritual sight? Did God take away what he could see so that he could reveal to him what he could not see? I mean, this is like a massive 180, guys. Well, Paul writes this in Galatians. He says, the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. See, Paul wasn't one of the disciples. He wasn't one of the, the people who walked with Jesus. He wasn't one of the 12. He wasn't even a follower. He was a hater. So Jesus gave him revelation in those moments. In that suddenly turnaround moment, what Satan had intended to destroy the church, God used as a catalyst for its growth. I don't know about you, but the, yeah, hallelujah, because you know what? The things that you're facing and you think, no way, no how, you know what? In a suddenly moment, God can turn it all around and say, that's exactly what I had planned all along. You just needed to be faithful. He did two things, Jesus did two things in that suddenly moment. He stopped the destruction of the church in Damascus. I know we're all praying for our Christians, brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. But I submit to you, we need to be praying for the Paul, for the Saul, for the Taliban. We need to be praying for them. We need to be praying that God will stop their progress and grab up his purposes, amen? That's what we need to be praying. And it's not always so easy. See how it's not easy to clap for that, right? Because you think, well, I don't like praying for my enemies. Well, you know what? Pray for them until they're not your enemies. Because that's what God calls us to do. That's what Jesus taught us. Pray for your enemies, right? So he stopped the destruction of the church in Damascus and he chose Saul for a world-changing mission. And for those of you with prodigals or those who just outright don't want anything to do with Jesus, be encouraged in this. 
Saul was not seeking Jesus when Jesus chose him. The Bible Engagement Project says it this way, God choosing you and me changes who we are. We become sons and daughters instead of orphans. We experience hope in the middle of pain. We have purpose that goes beyond death and we have a mission in him while we live on earth. We are set apart because he chose us and his choice changes us. Amen. And that leads to our verse of the week, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And some of you probably already know it. And that is, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new because Jesus changes everything. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead a little bit because you can read the rest of the passages of Scripture that Paul goes into Damascus. He's blind for three days. He's not eating. He's not drinking. And Jesus appears to a disciple named Ananias. It's the only time we hear of Ananias because he was just an ordinary guy. And I don't know about you, but that makes me excited because I'm just an ordinary girl waiting for Jesus to call me and say, go do that. Amen? Amen. Amen. And he called him and he said, go and pray for him. But what he told him first is he said, Saul is praying. Don't miss that. Saul is praying. You know, these, these pompous Pharisees, oh, well, I'm so glad I'm not like that lowly sinner. <laughs> no, he's praying. He's talking to me. He's repenting. He's seeking me. He's praying, he told Ananias. And he says, I've given him a vision of you. Someone, you're going to come. You're going to lay your hands on him and heal him. Ananias, go here, this place, this street, this house. Very, very specific. And then he said to this, he said this, go. This man, I'm sorry, let me back up one second. PowerPoint people are like, wait, she said this. Sorry. Ananias was like, um, hey, we've heard reports of this guy that he's coming here to arrest us. Right? Because sometimes you just kind of like, God, that doesn't make sense. But God told him to go. And this is what he said. He said, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name, for my name. And Ananias was like, it's good enough for him. If Jesus said, go, he'll go. And, and he went, and not only that, he called him Brother Saul, which is a whole moment of acceptance. And I want to charge you, my friends, my brothers and sisters, are we that quick to forgive the past of people and embrace them as brothers and sisters in the Lord? Are we that willing to say, oh, hey, here I've been a faithful disciple, but now you're going to call this guy who wanted to kill us? All right, I'll lay hands on him. Are we willing to just take God's plan and his purpose and trust it no matter what it looks like to us? Amen. Well, the scripture says that the healing occurred, something like scales fell off the eyes, and he got up and he was baptized. See, after he had his physical sight restored, his spiritual sight was restored, and he wanted to make a bold declaration to the Christians, the followers of Jesus in Damascus, I'm in this with you, because that's what baptism does. It makes a statement to the world, and if you haven't been baptized please consider it. Make that statement to the world that I belong to Jesus. The Bible Engagement Project says this, Saul, the persecutor of Christians, was transformed into a champion of Christianity. His passion for religion was replaced with a passion for Jesus. His knowledge of the law helped him to use the scriptures to prove Jesus is the Messiah. 
This man who had been molded by Jewish teachers and steeped in Jewish traditions now saw Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promise to all people. Saul became a champion of the faith to the Gentiles and the planter of multiple churches and later called Paul. He still speaks God's truth to us today as we read his writings in the New Testament. I just want you to know I've got a past. Everybody's got a story. Right? But I want you to, I want you to hold on to this. Your history does not dictate your destiny. Paul was a murderer. And yet God said, no, I chose you. So I want to say that again. Your history does not dictate your destiny, but it may have prepared you for it. So don't run away from it. Don't shy away from it. Because the person we were versus the person we are gives glory to God. See, Jesus changes everything. He redirects purpose. For Paul, Paul went from a persecutor of the church to an apostle of Jesus Christ. He redefines passion. Paul went from being devoted to the law, a Pharisee to the hilt. To re so in other words, he went from religion to relationship. And he reconciles people. Jesus reconciles people because he changes us from an orphan to a child of God. Or as Ananias said, brother Saul, we become part of the family of God. Amen? Because if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. And the old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. And I think sometimes we hear these scriptures and we roll them around in our brain. But we're not really sure. And I think, I think one of the challenges of the church, and I'm just going to be straight up with you, right? Because people who've grown up in the church your whole life, you tend to think, I don't have a story like that. Well, nobody has a story like Paul. <laughs> Let's be clear about that. But you know what? It, it's easy for people to stop doing, you know, to stop, well, maybe not easy, but, you know, to get away the surface things, the, the drugs and, and, and the, the, you know, the smoking and the cussing and, you know, those external things, those things that make us Christians uncomfortable. You know, the girls who wear their dresses up to here. Those things that make us uncomfortable. It's easy to address those external things. Because man looks at the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. And I want to tell you something. We need to be a church in order to, to uphold the name. In other words, in, 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 and to, I'm sorry, not other words. We need to uphold the name. And we need to stand firmly on the word of God. Amen. His word is for all people. And that means if people walk into our church that maybe don't look like us or act like us, because we're all different anyway, hello, newsflash, that we can welcome them here. Look, I'd rather have the prostitute walk in with the shirt, shortest skirt she owns and say, praise the Lord, she's here. We have to be willing to be uncomfortable instead of, oh, did you see that person? Yeah, we all have a story. We all have stuff in here, right? Search my heart, here's my heart. Speak what is true. My heart. The wickedness in my heart. It's so easy to persecute people. It's so easy to judge them. And it's so wrong. Because you're beating up the body. 
You're beating up Jesus. So as we close today, I just want to encourage you in this, that Jesus is still transforming lives. Because that's what he does. That's what he does well. He changes everything. One encounter changes everything. So I guess I just have a few questions for you to ponder, and we're going to go ahead and open the altar if you want to come and pray, and there'll be people who can come and pray with you. I just really think it's so important to take a minute and just let what just happened marinate in your heart instead of just get up and run out the door. Where is your devotion? Same as last week. Where is your devotion? Do you know that you're chosen? Do you really know that to the depth of your heart or you just hope so? Because if you're just hoping so, you can know so today. And I would love to talk to you about that. Where's your passion? Are you more concerned with religion and about looking good, external appearances? Or are you really fighting for that relationship with the Lord Jesus? And where is your purpose? Are you fighting against the Lord? Are you fighting against the body? See, Jesus is still calling. And he's still choosing. And no, Paul's the only one who ever had that domestic, uh, domestic, Damas I can't even speak, Damascus Road moment. But Jesus has a moment for you if you will come and meet with him today. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God. Father, we thank you that your character has never changed. Lord, that you chose us before we went looking for you. You had a purpose for us, even if we were 180 degrees in the other way. And Lord God, you're still calling some of us. You're still calling some of us to, to stop what we're doing so that we can walk in your purpose. And maybe, Lord, this message today is their Damascus Road moment. Maybe it's their moment where they're hearing your voice say, that's not what I have for you. Follow me. Lord God, yes, we, we pray for the persecuted church, but Lord God, we also pray for the persecutors. Lord God, that you would illuminate their hearts with the spiritual truth of who you are, just like you did for Paul. Because that changed everything. Lord God, we could, we could pray that they wouldn't kill people, and maybe, maybe we could pray for one or two or three people we know, but if we can pray, Lord, that you stop the oppressor, if you stop the persecutor, Lord, there's hundreds of people. And Lord God, we know that only you can do it. Only you can do it. Because you are sovereign, and you are mighty, and you are holy. And it is your purpose because your word tells us that it's your desire that all men would be saved. And so, Lord God, we call upon your mercy and your grace. And we call upon your word. And we stand firm for the name in our generation, Lord God, at the grocery store or in countries around the world and everything in between, in our homes, in our own selves, Lord God. <laughs> you tell us not to be hearers of the word and so deceive yourselves, but to do what it says. Lord God, let us be bold and courageous. Let us be willing to be persecuted and suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus because there is no other name given unto men under heaven by which they must be saved. So Lord God, please save your people and raise up your church 
to be light and instruments and willing, obedient disciples and servants that will go wherever it is that you tell us to go and speak to whomever you ask us to speak to, that you would be glorified and heaven would be filled to the glory of the Father. And all God's people said, amen. I pray that you'll take some time and just, as I said, let it marinate for you. Will we stand? Will we stand for the name in our generation? I pray to God we will. God bless you.
I have called you to be a light in the darkness. I have called you to speak truth to those that are dying, truth that will set them free. I tell you that you may and you will experience persecution, but I ask you this day, do you love my son enough that you would be willing to be persecuted for his name? Do you love him enough that you will go in boldness and zeal and you will declare that he is the way, the truth, and the life? Do you love him enough that you would allow yourself to be crucified with Christ, that you no longer live, but he lives within you? I tell you, my children, I have called you and I have equipped you and I tell you to go now into the world and that you would be the light, that you would be the salt of the earth, that you would bring my love and truth and grace to this generation. I tell you that I am coming soon and this is the hour of preparation. I am calling my people to repentance. I am calling you to be the bride that is without spot or wrinkle. I am calling you to be holy as you are holy. I am calling you to love as I have loved you. Oh, the people of this world need to know my love. They need to know that I sent my son for them. Will you go in my love and in my power and my grace to this generation? Today is the defining moment. Who will you choose to serve? 